sure you can see. Yeah. Okay, so, hi. Right. We're very close. We're right on top of each other. How lovely. Um, let's see if I can move that just a bit. Okay, what you're seeing is part of... Um, where's the camera? There we go. Okay, what you're seeing over there is 16, a two-panel painting I've been working on. And I'm not sure if I was working on it on camera the other day or not. I don't really remember. But behind me is Leslie Jones. And Leslie has kind of been all over the map in terms of structure and color and me not getting it right for a really long time. But a little while ago, I did something I didn't want to do. I wanted her hair up and off the canvas, but it was taking away from her face and not helping me to put her together correctly. She felt disingenuous and off. So I went back and I found other photographs of Leslie Jones with the, her hair, how it, how it sits properly, not just way up off the, you know, way up in the air and, you know, never ending. So uh, that's really helped to bring, bring her face down. Let me see if I can pull the camera in a little bit. Ugh, she still looks off because of the camera angle. But, um, yeah, she looks funky because of the camera angle. Her eyes are actually balanced, nose, mouth, but she is on two different uh, canvases. She's on two canvases. Um, I did it for a couple of reasons. It makes life more interesting for me in the job of painting, and also it makes shipping easier and a little less expensive. But what I'm concerned about is whether I'm interested or not. So I'll put her back together, and she works. And now the cool thing actually is, um, you know, if anyone en ends up taking her, and we've had a couple of inquiries, uh, Leslie, like half of Leslie can go in one room or on one wall, and the other half of Leslie can go in another wall. But I'm really happy with her right now. She's starting to relax. Let me see if I can get a better angle for you. This is tough. This does not take the best photographs or um, best video sometimes. But as you can see, she's she's pretty well balanced. It's still she's still feeling off. I'm looking at her in the camera, and this feels off. But in person and in a mirror, it's actually really well balanced, and the proportions are correct. Whoop, hello, top of Leslie's head. So I'm just going to continue painting. Um, there were a ton of tiny little details in here that I'd gotten from my doilies while I was stenciling. But I'm evening them out now because I need them to be bigger and make more of a statement so that it pulls into her and doesn't take away from her face. But I'm extending the idea of the, uh, you know, the doily idea and the um, fancy bits into a lace dress, kind of a lace dress, and also onto her skin or what could be part of the lace dress. So that's where we are. I'm wicked happy with her now, although she looks cockeyed in the camera and it's driving me nuts. But she's... She's not. Her eyes are not cockeyed. I was very careful about that. She is not cockeyed. She's not cockeyed, I swear to God! But, um... Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue painting, and I'm gonna let's, let's see if I pull this in a little bit. That's more interesting for the viewer. Um, I'm gonna put on Le, uh, Walter Mosley. I love Walter Mosley, the writer, and I've been listening to something by him. I'll find the case and show you, and we can listen. And I'm turning on the fan. It's very warm in here. It's Florida, of course. It's warm in here. Let me tell you something, young man, Lena said. That's the reason I know do. her is that she worked in my restaurant in the last two Walter years. Walter Mosley, Cinnamon Kiss. She was just a girl, but sharp and true. She loved to work and learn. I wish my own son had her wits. After the restaurant closed, she came to see me every week to learn from what I knew. She was no crook. So did she have any close friends down here? I didn't know her friends. She saw boys, but they were never serious. The young men around here don't value a woman with brains and talent. Do you know how I can find her? I asked, giving up subtlety. No. Maybe I thought she was lying, because all I could see was the opaque, reflective surface of her glasses. 
If you hear from her, will you tell her that I'm looking for the documents Bowers took? What documents? All I know is that he took some papers that have red seals on them. But I'm not worried about them as much as I'm worried about Miss Cargill's safety. Lena nodded. If she did know where Philomena was, she'd be sure to give her the message. I wrote down my home and office numbers. And then I helped Lena put away the groceries. Her refrigerator was empty except for two hard-boiled eggs. With my legs the way they are, it's hard for me to get out shopping very much. She oh, nice. said, apologizing for her meager fare. I nodded and smiled. I come down to my office at least twice a week, Lena. I can always make a supermarket run for you. She patted my forearm yeah, and says, Bless you. There are all kinds of freedom in America. Free speech, the right to bear arms. But when the years have piled up so high on their back that they can't stand up straight anymore, Many Americans find out they also have the freedom to starve. At a phone booth down the street from Lena's house, I looked up a number and then made a call. Hello, a man answered. Billy? Hey, easy. She ain't here. You know when she'll be in? She at work, man. On Saturday? They pay her to sit down in her office when the band comes in for practice. She opens up the music building at nine and then closes it at three. Not bad for time and a half. Okay, I said. I'll go over and see her there. Bye, easy. Take care. Jordan High School had a sprawling campus. There were over 3,000 students enrolled. I came in through the athletic gate and made my way toward the boiler room. That's where Helen McCoy made her private office. She was the building supervisor of the school a position two grades above the one I had just left. Helen was short and redheaded, smart as they come, and tougher than most men. I had seen her kill a man in third ward one night. He slapped her face and then balled up a fist. When she pressed five inches of a Texas jackknife into his chest, he sat down on the floor, dying as he did so. Hi, easy, she said with a smile. She was sitting at a long table next to the boiler writing on a small white card. There was a large stack of blank cards on her left and a smaller stack on the right. The right side cards had already been written on. Party, I asked. My daughter Vanessa's getting married. These invitations, you getting one? I sat down and waited. When Helen finished writing the card, she sat back and smiled, indicating that I had her attention. Philomena Cinnamon Cargill, I said. I hear she was a student here some years ago. Lil Young, Helen suggested. It's my other job, I said. I'm looking for her for somebody. Grapevine says you quit the board. Sabbatical. Don't shit me easy. You quit. I didn't argue. Smart girl, that Philomena, Helen said. Let it in track and Archer gave the big speech at her graduation. Jesus Christ. She was wild, okay. too. Wild how? Sorry, I'm posting she on She wasn't YouTube. shy of boys, Twitter. that one. One time I found her in the boys' locker room after hours with Maurice Johnson. Her drawers was down and her hands was busy. Helen grinned. She'd been wild herself. I was told that her father died and her mother left for Chicago, I said. You know anybody else she might be in touch with? She had a school friend named Raphael Reed. He was funny, if you know what I mean. So he never got jealous of her running around. Okay. That all? Here we go. All I can think of. Or posted on uh, Twitter and Facebook. You think you could go down and pull Reed's records for me? Your Helen considered my request. We've known each other a long time, haven't we, Easy? Sure have. You the one got me this job. And you moved up past me in grade in two years. I don't have no job on the side to distract me, she said. I nodded, yeah, submitting no. to All her right. line. Yeah, posting. You know I ain't supposed to give the public information on students or faculty. I know that. She laughed then. Now I guess we all do things we ain't supposed to do sometimes. Can't help it, I agreed. Wait here, she said, patting the table with her knife hand. I'll be back in a few minutes. Chapter 22 I told Raphael's mother, a small, dark woman with big, brown, hopeful eyes, 
that I was Philomena Cargill's uncle and that I needed to talk to her son about a pie-baking business that my niece and I were starting up in Oakland. All I hoped for was a phone number, but Althea was so happy about the chance for a job for her son that she gave me his address, too. This brought me to a three-story wooden apartment building on Santa Barbara Boulevard. It was a wide building that had begun to sag in the middle. Maybe that's why the landlord painted it bright turquoise, to make it seem young and sprightly. I walked up the sign stairs to 2A. The door was painted with black and turquoise zebra stripes, and the letters RRRR were carved into the center. The young man who answered my knock wore only black jeans. His body was slender and strong. His hair was long, but not hippie long, and straightened, then curled. He wasn't very tall, and the sneer on his lips was almost comical. Yes? He asked in such a way that he seemed to be suggesting something obscene. I knew right then that this was the young man who'd hung up on me, the one I'd called from Philomena's apartment. Raphael Reed. And who are you? Easy Rollins, I said. What can I do for you, Easy Rollins? He asked while appraising my stature and style. I think that a friend of yours may have been the victim of foul play. What friend? Cinnamon. It was all in the young man's eyes. Suddenly, the brash flirtation and sneering facade disappeared. Now there was a man standing before me, a man who was ready to take serious action depending on what I said next. Come in. It was a studio apartment. A Murphy bed had been pulled down from the wall. It was unmade and jumbled with dirty clothes and dishes. A black and white portable TV with bent up rabbit ear antennas sat on a maple chair at the foot of the bed. There was no sofa, but three big chairs, upholstered with green carpeting, were set in a circle facing each other at the center of the room. The room smelled strongly of perfumes and body odors. This scent of sex and sensuality was off-putting on a Saturday afternoon. Come on out, Roger, Raphael said. A door opened, and another young man, nearly a carbon copy of the first, emerged. They were the same height, and had the same hairstyle. Ugh. Roger also wore black Oops. jeans, no shirt, and a sneer. But where Raphael had the dark skin of his mother, Roger was the color of light brown sugar and had freckles on his nose and shoulders. Sit, Raphael said to me. We all went to the chairs in a circle. I liked the configuration, but it still felt odd somehow. And what about Philomena? Raphael asked. Her boss disappeared, I said. A man named Adams hired me to find him. He also told me that Philomena had disappeared a couple of days later. I went to her apartment and found that she'd moved out without even taking her clothes. Raphael glanced at his friend, but Roger was inspecting his nails. So what? You're her friend, I said. Aren't you worried? Who says I'm her friend? At Jordan, you two shared notes on boys. What the hell do you mean by that? He asked. I realized that I had gone too far, that no matter how much it seemed that these young men were homosexuals, I was not allowed to talk about it. Just that she had a lot of boyfriends, I said. Roger made a catty little grunt. It was the closest he came to speaking. Well, Raphael said, I haven't even spoken to her since the day she graduated. Jesus Christ. Valedictorian, wasn't she? She sure was. Raphael said with some pride in his tone. Nope. Is Roger here a friend of hers? What? She did call here, didn't she? I asked. You the nigga called the other day, Raphael said. I thought I knew your voice. Look, man, I'm not trying to mess with you or your friends. I don't care about anything but finding Bowers for the man hired me. I think that Philomena is in trouble. Because why else would she leave her place without taking her clothes and her personal things? If you know where she is, tell her that I'm looking for her. I don't know where she is. Take my number. If she calls, I'm give it to her. About the glare. I don't need your number. I wondered if my daughter could die because of this petulant boy. The thought made me want to slap him, but I held my temper. You're making a mistake, I said. Your friend could get hurt. Bad. Raphael's lips formed a snarl, and his head reared back, snake-like, but he didn't say a word. I got up and walked out, 
glad that I'd left my new stolen Luger at home. Chapter 23. I drove home carefully, making sure to check every traffic yep. light twice. Turn Once in my house, lights. I gave in to a kind of weariness. It's not that I was tired, but there was nothing I could do. I'd done all I could about Philomena Cargill, and even though I chummed the waters for her, I doubted that she was alive to take the bait. Bonnie was off, probably with Joe Gwei Chom, her prince, and Feather would die unless I made $35,000 quickly. She might die anyway. She might already be dead. I hadn't had a drink in many years. Liquor took a toll on me, but Johnny Walker was still in the back seat of the car, and I went to my front door more than once, intent on retrieving him. And why not take up the bottle again? There was no one to disapprove. Oblivion called to me. I could navigate the tidal wave of my life on a full tank. I'd be a black Ulysses singing with the stars. It was early evening when I went out the front door into my borrowed car. I looked in the window at the slender brown bag on the back seat. I wanted to open the door, but I couldn't, because even though there was no trace of feather, she was still there. Looking at the back seat, I thought about her riding in the back seat of my Ford. She was laughing, leaning up against the seat as the young hippie star had done, telling me and Jesus about her wild adventures on the playground and in the classroom. Sometimes she made up stories about her and Billy Chipkin crossing Olympic and going up to the county art museum. There, she'd say, they had seen pictures of naked ladies and kings. I remember her sitting by my side in the front seat reading Little Women, snarling whenever I interrupted her with questions about what she wanted for dinner or when she was going to pick up her room. Dozens of memories came between me and that door handle. I got dizzy and sat down on the lawn. I put my head in my hands and pressed all ten fingers hard against my scalp. Go back in the house. The voice that was me and not me said, Go back and do it until she's in her room dreaming again. Then, when she's safe, you can have that bottle all night long. The phone rang at that moment. It was a weak jingle, almost not there. I struggled to my feet, staggering as if Feather were already healed and I was drunk on the celebration. My pants were wet from the grass. The weak bleating of the phone grew loud when I opened the door. Hello. So what's it gonna be, Ease? Mouse asked. It made me laugh. I got to move on this, brother, he continued. Opportunity don't wait around. I'll call you in the morning, Ray, I said. What time? After I wake up. This is serious, man, he told me. Those words from his lips had been the prelude to many a man's death, but I didn't care. Tomorrow, I said, in the morning. And then I hung up. I turned on the radio. There was a jazz station from USC that was playing 24 hours of John Coltrane. I liked the new jazz, but my heart was still with Fats Waller and Duke Ellington, that big band sound. I turned on the TV. Some detective show was on. I don't know what it was about. Just a lot of shouting and cars screeching, a shot now and then, and a woman who screamed when she got scared. I'd been rereading Native Son by Richard Wright lately, so I hefted it off the shelf and opened to a dog ear page. The words scrambled and the radio hummed. Every now and then I'd look up to see that a new show was on the boot, yep. too. By midnight, every light in the house was burning. I'd switch them on one at a time as I got up now and then to check out various parts of the house. I was reading about a group of boys masturbating in a movie theater when the phone rang again. For a moment, I resisted answering. If Mouse had gotten mad, I didn't know if I could placate him. If it was Bonnie telling me that Feather was dead, I didn't know that I could survive. Hello, Mr. Rollins. It was Maya Adamant. How'd you get my home number? Saul Lynx gave it to me. What do you want, Miss Adamant? There has been a resolution to the Bowers case, she said. You found the briefcase? All I can tell you is that we have reached a determination about the disposition of the papers and of Mr. Bowers. You don't even want me to report on what I've found? I asked. This caused a momentary pause in my dismissal. What information? She asked. I found Axel, I said. Really? 
Yes, really. He came down to L.A. to get away from Haffernan, also to be nearer to Miss Cargill. She's down there? You've seen her? Sure have, I lied. Another silence. In that time, I tried to figure Maya's response to my talking to Cinema. Her surprise might have been a clue that she knew Philomena was dead. Then again, maybe she'd been given contradictory information. What did Bauer say? She asked. Am I fired, Miss Adamant? You've been paid $1,500. Against 10000 I added. Does that mean you are withholding intelligence from Mr. Lee? I'm not talking to Mr. Lee. I carry his authority. I spent a summer unloading cargo ships down in Galveston back in the 30s, I said. Smelled like tar and fish. And you know, I was only 15 with a sensitive nose. My back hurt carrying them cartons of clothes and fine china and whatever else the man said I should carry for 35 cents a day. I had his authority. But I was just a day laborer still and all. What did Axel say? Am I fired? No, she said after a very long pause. Let Lee call me back and say that. Robert E. Lee is not a man to fool with, Mr. Rollins. I like it when you call me Mr., I said. It shows that you respect me, so listen up. If I'm fired, then I'm through. If Lee wants me to be a consultant based on what I know, then let him call me himself. You're making a big mistake, Easy. Mistake was made before I was even born, honey. I came into it crying, and I'll go out hollering, too. She hung up without another word. I couldn't blame her, but neither could I walk away without trying to make my daughter's money. I sautéed chopped garlic, minced fresh jalapeno, green pepper, and a diced shallot in ghee that I'd rendered myself. I added some ground beef, and after the meat had browned, I put in some cooked rice from a pot in the refrigerator. That was my meal for the night. I fell asleep on the love seat with every light in the house on, the television flashing, and John Coltrane bleeding about his favorite things. Chapter 24. I moved the trunk in front of the big brass elephant. Underneath was the crushed cubicle body of Axel Bowers. I watched him, worrying once again about the degradation of his carcass. I told him that I was sorry, and he moved his head in a little semicircle as if trying to work out a kink in his neck. With his hands, he lifted his head, raising it up from the hole. It took him a long while to crawl out of the makeshift grave, and longer still to straighten out all of the bloody, cracked, and shattered limbs. He looked to me like a butterfly just out of a cocoon, unfolding its wet wings. All of that work he did without noticing me pulling on his left arm, turning his foot around until the ankle snapped into place, pressing his temples until his forehead was once more round and hard. He was putting his fingers back into alignment when he happened to look up and notice me. I'm going to need a new hip, he said. What? The hip bones don't reform like other bones, he said. They need to be replaced or I won't be able to walk very far. Where you got to go? I asked. There's a Nazi hiding in Egypt. He's going to assassinate the president. The president was assassinated three years ago, I said. There's a new president, Axel assured me. And if this one goes, we'll be in deep shit. The phone rang. You going to get that? Axel asked. I should stay with you. Don't worry. I can't go anywhere. I'm stuck right here on my broken hips. The phone rang. I wandered back through the house. In the kitchen, Dizzy Gillespie had taken Coltrane's place. He was standing in front of the sink with his cheeks puffed out like a bullfrog's, blowing on that trumpet. The front door was open, and the mummy was playing outside. The movie was now somehow like a play being enacted in the street. On the sidewalks all the way up to the corners, Extras and actors with small roles were smoking cigarettes and talking, waiting to come on stage to do their parts. Egypt, I thought, and the phone rang. I came back in the house, but the phone wasn't on its little table. Above, on the bookshelf, Bigger Thomas was strangling a woman who was laughing at him. 
You can't kill me, she said. I'm better than you are. I'm still alive. The phone rang again. I returned to the brass elephant to tell Axel something, but he was back in his hole, crushed and debased. My hips were my downfall, he said. You can make it, I told him. Lots of people live in wheelchairs. I will not be a cripple. The phone rang, and he disappeared. I opened my eyes. The mummy with Boris Karloff was playing on TV. Coltrane had not been replaced, and every light in the house was still on. I wondered about the coincidence of a movie about a corpse rising from the dead in Egypt and Axel's trips to that country. The phone rang. Somebody must really want to talk, I said to myself, thinking that the phone must have rung nearly a dozen times. I went to the podium and picked up the receiver. Hello, why are you looking for me? A woman's voice asked. Philomena, is that you? I asked you a question. My lips felt numb. Coltrane hit a discordant note. I thought you were dead, I said. You, you didn't even take any underwear as far as I could tell. What woman leaves without a change of underwear? I am alive, she said. So you can stop looking for me. I'm not looking for you, honey. It's your boyfriend Axel and them papers he stole. Axel's gone. Dead? Who said anything about dead? He's gone. Left the country. Just up and left his house without telling anybody. Not even Dream Dog? Who are you working for, Mr. Rollins? Call me easy. Who are you working for? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? A man I know came to me with $1,500 and said that another man up in Frisco was willing to pay that and more for locating Axel Bowers. That man said he was working for somebody else, but he didn't tell me who. After I looked around, I found out that you and Axel were friends, that you disappeared too. So here I am with you on the phone, just a breath away. You weren't that far wrong about me, Easy, the woman called Cinnamon said. What exactly was I right about? I think there is a man trying to kill me. A man who wants the papers that Axel has. What's this man's name? I asked, made brave by the anonymity of the phone lines. I don't know his name. He's a white man with dead eyes. He wear a snakeskin jacket? I asked on a hunch. Yes. Where are you? Hiding, she said. Safe. I'll come to you and we'll try and work this thing out. No, I don't want your help. What I want is for you to stop looking for me. Nothing would make me happier than to let this drop, but I'm in it now. All the way in it, I said, thinking about Axel's hip bones. So either we get together or I talk to the man who pays my salary. He's probably the one trying to have me killed. You don't know that. Axel told me. He said that people would kill for those papers. Then that man, he... He what? She hung up the phone. I held onto the receiver for a full minute, at least. Sitting there, I thought again about my dream, about the corpse trying to resuscitate himself. Philomena had described a killer who had been at my doorstep. All of a sudden, the prospect of robbing an armored car delivery didn't seem so dangerous. I had a good laugh then. There I was, all alone in the night, with killers and thieves milling outside in the darkness. I rooted my thirty-eight out of the closet and made sure that it was loaded. The Luger was a fine gun, but I had no idea how old its ammo was. I went around the house, turning off lights. In bed, I was overcome by a feeling of giddiness. I felt as if I had just missed a fatal accident by a few inches. In a little while, Bonnie's infidelity and Feather's dire illness would return to disturb my rest. But right then, I was at peace in my bed, all alone and safe. Then the phone rang. I had to answer. It might be Bonnie. It might be my little girl wanting me to tell her that things would be fine. It could be Mouse or Saul or Maya Adamant. But I knew that it wasn't any of them. Hello. I'm at the Pixie Inn on Sloss, she said. But I'm very tired. Can you come in the morning? What's the room number? Six. What size dress you wear? 
I asked. Two, she said. Why? I'll see you at seven. I hung up and wondered at the mathematics of my mind. Why had I agreed to go to her when I'd just been thankful for a peaceful heist? It's you, the son of a fool, and the father of nothing. The voice that had abandoned me for so many years said. Okay. Again, I'm listening to, or we're listening to Walter Mosley's Cinnamon Kiss. I'm going to go change the CD. Then I'm going to sit down and start working on the lower half, lower part of her. I think she's pulling together well. Chapter 25 I couldn't sleep anymore that night. At four, I got up and started cooking. First I fried three strips of bacon. I cracked two eggs and dropped them into the bacon fat. Then I covered one slice of whole wheat bread with yellow mustard and another one with mayonnaise. I grated orange cheddar on the eggs after I flipped them, put the lid on the frying pan, and turned off the gas flame. I made a strong brew of coffee, which I poured into a two-quart thermos. Then I made the eggs and bacon into a sandwich that I wrapped in wax paper. Riding down Slauson at 5.15 with the brown paper bag next to me and Johnny Walker in the back seat, I tried to come up with some kind of plan. I considered Maya and Lee, dead Axel and scared cinnamon, and the man in the snakeskin jacket. There was no sense to it, no goal to work toward except making enough money to pay for Feather's hospital bed. I parked across the street from the motel. It was of a modern design, three stories high, with doors that opened to unenclosed platforms. Number six was on the ground floor. Its door opened onto the parking lot. I suppose that Philomena wanted to be able to jump out the back window if need be. I sat in my car, wondering what I should ask the girl. What should I tell her? Should it be true? When my Timex read 618, the door of number 6 opened. A tall woman wearing dark slacks and a long white t-shirt came out. Even from that distance, I could see that she was brawless and barefoot. Her skin had a reddish hue, and her hair was long and straightened. She walked to the soda machine near the motel office, put in her coins, and then bent down to get the soda that fell out. The streets were so quiet that I heard the jumbling glass. She walked back to the door looked around, then went inside. A minute later, I was walking toward her door. I listened for a moment. There was no sound. I knocked. Still no sound. I knocked again. Then I heard a shushing sound like the slide of a window. It's me, Philomena, I said loudly. Easy Rawlins. It only took her half a minute to come to the door and open it. Five nine with chiseled features and big dramatic eyes. That was Philomena Cargill. Her skin was indeed cinnamon red. Lena's photograph of her had faithfully recorded the face, but it hadn't given even a hint of her beauty. I held out the paper bag. What's this? An egg sandwich and coffee, I said. While she didn't actually grab the bag, she did take it with eager hands. She went to one of the two single beds and sat with the sack on her lap. After closing the door, I put the cloth bag I'd brought on the bed across from her and sat next to it. There were three lamps in the room. They were all on, but the light was dim at best. Philomena tore open the sandwich and took a big bite out of it. I'm a vegetarian usually, she said with her mouth full. But this bacon is good. While she ate, I poured her a plastic cup full of coffee. I put milk in it, I said as she took the cup from me. I don't care if you put vinegar in it. I need this. I left my house with only $40 in my purse. It's all gone now. She didn't speak again until the cup was drained and the sandwich was gone. What's in the other bag? She asked. I believe she was hoping for another sandwich. Two dresses, some panties, and tennis shoes. She came to sit on the other side of the bag, 
taking out the clothes and examining them with an expert feminine eye. The dress is perfect, she said, and the shoes will do. Where'd you get these? My son's girlfriend left them. She's a skinny thing, too. When Cinnamon smiled at me, I understood the danger she represented. She was more than pretty or lovely or even beautiful. There was something regal about her. I almost felt like bowing to show her how much I appreciated the largesse of her smile. They say that Hitler was a vegetarian, too, I said, and the smile shriveled on her lips. So what? Why don't you tell me, Philomena? After regarding me for a moment, she said, Why should I trust you? Because I'm on your side, I said. I don't want any harm coming to you, and I'll work to see that no one else hurts you either. I don't know any of that. Sure you do, I said. You talked to Lena about me. She gave you my number. She told you that I've traded tough favors down around here for nearly 20 years. She also said that she's heard that people you've helped have wound up hurt and even dead sometimes. That might be. With any girl being followed by a snakeskin killer got to expect some danger, I counter. I'd be a fool if I told you everything will work out fine and you'd be a fool to believe it. But if you all mixed up with murder, then you need somebody like me. It don't matter that you got a business degree from UC Berkeley and a boyfriend got Paul Clay paintings hanging on his walls. If something goes wrong, you the first one they gonna look at. And if a white killer wanna kill somebody, a black woman will be the first on his list. Cause you know the cops will ask you if you had a boyfriend they could pin it on. And if you don't, they'll call you a whore and close the book. Philomena listened very carefully to my speech. Her royal visage made me feel like some kind of minister to the crown. What do you want from me? She asked. What papers did Axel steal? He didn't steal anything. He found those papers in a safe deposit box his father had. He kept them with memorabilia he had from Germany. When Mr. Bowers died, he left the key to Axel. If that's so, then why did Haffernan tell the man who hired me that Axel stole the papers from him? Who hired you? I told her about Robert Lee and his Amazon assistant. She had never heard of either one. Haffernan and Mr. Bowers and another man were partners before the war. They worked in chemicals, Philomena said. But who was their partner? A man named Tourneau, Riga Tourneau. They did some bad things, illegal things during the war. What kind of things? Treason. No, I was still a good American back in those days. It was almost impossible for me to believe that American businessmen would betray the country that had made them rich. The papers are Swiss bearer bonds issued in 1943 for work done by the Karnak Chemical Company in Cairo, Philomena said. And even though the bonds themselves are only endorsed by the banks, there's a letter from top Nazi officials that details the expectations that the Nazis had of Karnak. Whoa. And Axel wanted to cash the bonds? No. He didn't know what he wanted exactly, but he knew that something should be done to make amends for his father's sins. But Haffernan doesn't want to pay the price. I said. What about this Tourneau guy? I don't know about him. Axel just said that he's out of it. Dead? I don't know. What did his father's company do for the Nazis? I asked. They developed special kinds of explosives that the Germans used for construction in a few of their slave labor camps. And what do you get out of all this? I asked. Me? I was just helping you. No. I don't hardly know you at all, girl, but I do know that you look out for number one. What's Axel going to do for you? Cinnamon let her left shoulder rise, seeding a point that was hardly worth the effort. He had friends in business. He was going to set me up in a job somewhere, but he would have done that even if I hadn't tried to help. I was suddenly aware of a slight dizziness. But it didn't hurt, I said. You could work all you wanted. What? she asked. I realized that the last part of what I said didn't make sense. I blinked, finding it hard to open my eyes again. I shook my head, but the cobwebs went nowhere. Philomena. Yes? 
Would you mind if I just laid out here a minute? I haven't got much sleep looking for you, and I'm tired, real tired. Her smile was a thing to behold. Maybe I could rest too, she said. I've been so scared alone in this room. Let's get a short nap, and then we can finish talking in a while. I lay back on the bed as I spoke. She said something. It seemed like a really long sentence, but I couldn't make out the words. I closed my eyes. Uh-huh, I said out of courtesy, and then I was asleep. Chapter 26. In the dream, I was kissing Bonnie. She whispered something sweet and kissed my forehead and my lips. I tried to hold myself back to tell her how angry I was. But every time her lips touched mine, my mouth opened and her tongue washed away all my angry words. I need you, she told me, and I had to strain to hold back the tears. She pressed her body against mine. I held her so tight that she pulled away for a moment, but then she was kissing me again. Thank God, I whispered. Thank God. I reached down into her panties, and she moaned. But when I felt her cold hand on my erection, I realized that it wasn't Bonnie. It wasn't Bonnie because it wasn't a dream, and Bonnie was in Switzerland. Who was in my bed? Nobody. Another deeply felt kiss. I was in a motel room with Cinnamon Cargill. I raised up, pushing her away as I did so. Her t-shirt was up to her midriff. My erection was standing straighter than it had in some while. She reached out and stroked it lightly with two fingers. The groan came from my lips against my will. I stood up, pushed the urgent cock back behind the zipper. Cinnamon sat up and smiled. I was scared, she explained. I just lay down next to you and went to sleep. What could I say? I guess you must have kissed me in your sleep, she said. It was nice. Yeah, I wondered if it was me who cast the first kiss. I'm sorry about that. Nothing to be sorry about. It's natural. I have protection. Even her sexy nonchalance was imperial. Where'd you get that? I asked her. You left with nothing. I always have a backup in my wallet, she said, sounding decidedly like a man. Let's go get some breakfast, I said. A shadow of disappointment darkened her features for a moment, and then she pulled on her pants, which she dropped on the floor next to my bed. I wanted breakfast, even though it was two in the afternoon. Philomena and I had slept for almost eight hours before we started making out. Brenda's burgers had everything I needed, an all-day breakfast menu, and a booth at the back of her tiny diner where you could talk without being overheard. It was a small restaurant with pitted floors and mismatched furniture. The cook and waiter was a dark-skinned, mustachioed man with mistrustful eyes. I ordered fried ham and buttermilk biscuits. Philomena wanted a steak with collard greens, mashed potatoes, and salad. I thought you were a vegetarian, I asked. Need to keep up my strength, she replied. I was a little off because the erection hadn't gone all the way down. My heart was thrumming, and every time she smiled, I wanted to suggest going back to her room and finishing off what we had started. What's wrong, she asked me. Nothing. Why you ask? You seem kind of nervous. This is just the way I am, I said. Okay. Tell me about the man in the snakeskin jacket, I said, watching the cook eye us from behind the kitchen window. He came to Axel's house one day last week. I was in the hallway that led to the bedroom, but I could see them through a crack in the double doors. They didn't know you were there? Axel knew, but the other guy didn't. He told Axel that he needed the papers his father left. Axel told him that they'd been given to a third party who would make them public upon his death. Watching her, listening to her story made me sweat. Maybe it was the heat from the kitchen, but I didn't think so. Neither did I feel my temperature came from anything having to do with sex. Did he threaten Axel? Yes. He said, a man can get hurt if he doesn't know when to fold. He's right about that, I said wanting to stave off the details of Axel's murder. 
He was a frightening man. Asshole was scared, but he stood up to him. What happened then? The man left. He didn't hurt Axel? No, but he put the fear of God into him. He told me to get out of there, not even to go home. He gave me the money he had in his pocket and said to go down to L.A. until he figured out what to do. Why you? I asked. He wasn't after you. Axel and I were close. There was a brazen look on Cinnamon's face, as if she were daring me to question her choice of lovers. So you have the papers, I said. She didn't deny it. Those papers can get you killed, I said. I've been trying to call Axel for days, she said, agreeing with me in her tone. I called his cousin, but Harmon hadn't heard from him, and there's no answer at his house. And how about his office? He never tells them anything. How many people know where you are now? I asked. No one. What about Lena? I call her every other day or so, but I don't tell her where I am. And Raphael? That was the first time I'd surprised her. How did you? I'm a real live detective, honey. Finding out things is what I do. No, I mean, I've talked to Rafe, but I didn't tell him where I was staying. Have you seen anybody you know, or have they seen you? I don't think so. Are you willing to trade those papers for your life? I asked. Axel made me promise to turn them in if anything happened, she said. Axel's dead, I said. You don't know that. Yes, I do. And you know it too, I told her. This is big money here. You learn more out of this than five PhDs at Harvard could ever tell you. Axel messed with some big men's money, and now he's dead. If you want to live, you would better think straight. I, I have to think about this. I should at least try to find Axel once more. I didn't want to implicate myself in the particulars of Axel's demise, so I reached into my pocket and peeled off five of Mouse's twenties. I palmed the wad and handed it to her under the table. At first she thought I was trying to hold her hand. She clutched at my fingers and then felt the bills. What's this? Money. Pay for your room and some food, but don't go out much. Try to hide your face if you do. You got my office number, too? She nodded. I'll call you tonight, or at the latest, tomorrow morning. You got to decide, though, honey. She nodded. You want to come back to the room with me? I'll walk you, but then I got to get going. Got to get a bead on how we get you out of this jam. Her shoulder heaved again, saying that a roll in the hay would have been nice, but okay. I knew she was just afraid to be alone. I made it to my office a little bit before four. There were three messages on the machine. The first was from Feather. Hi, Daddy. Me and Bonnie got here after a long time on three airplanes. Now I'm in a house on a lake, but tomorrow they're going to take me to the clinic. I met the doctor and he was real nice, but he talks funny. I miss you, Daddy, and I wish you would come and see me soon. Oh, yeah, and Bonnie says she misses you, too. I turned off the machine for a while after that. In my mind, every phrase she used turned over and over. Bonnie saying that she missed me, the doctor's accent. She sounded happy, not like a dying girl at all. I was so distracted by these thoughts that I didn't hear him open the door. I looked up on instinct, and he was standing there, not six feet from where I sat, head in hands. He was a white man, slender and tall, wearing dark green slacks and a jacket of tan and brown scales. His hat was also dark green with a small brim. His skin was olive colored and his pale eyes seemed to have no color at all. Ezekiel Rollins? Who are you? Are you Ezekiel Rollins? Who the fuck are you? There was a moment there for us to fight. He was peeved at me not answering his question. I was mad at myself for not hearing him open the door. Or maybe I hadn't closed it behind me. Either way, I was an idiot. But then, Snakeskin smiled. Joe Cicero, he said. I'm a private operative, too. Detective? Not exactly. His smile had no humor in it. What do you want? Are you Ezekiel Rollins? 
Yeah. Why? I'm looking for a girl. Try down on Avalon near Florence. There's a cat house behind the laundromat. Philomena Cargill. Never heard of her. Oh, yeah. You have. You talked to her, and now I need to do the same thing. I remember the first day I opened the office, two years earlier. I'd had a little party to celebrate the opening. All of my friends, the ones who were still alive, had come. Mouse was there, drinking and eating onion dip that Bonnie made. He waited until everyone else had gone before handing me a paper bag that held a pistol, some chicken wire, and a few U-shaped tacks. Let's put this sucker in, he said. In what? Under the desk, fool. You know you can't be working with these niggas down here without having an edge. Shit, some motherfucker come in here all mad or vengeful and there you are without a pot to piss in. No, brother, we got to put this here gun under your desk so that when the shit hit the fan, at least you got an even chance. I slid my hand around the smooth butt of the 25 caliber gift. I don't know no Cargill, I said. Who says that I do? Cicero made an easy move with his hand, and I came out with my gun. I pointed it at his head just in case he was wearing something bulletproof on his chassis. The threat just made him smile. Nervous. Aren't you, son? He said. Well, you should be. Who said I know this woman? You have 24 hours, Mr. Rollins, he replied. 24, or things will get bad. Do you see this gun? I asked him. He grinned and said, Family man like you has to think about his liabilities. Me? I'm just a soldier. Knock one down and two take his place. But you, you have Feather and Jesus and what's her name, Bonnie? Yeah, Bonnie, to think about. With that he turned and walked out the door. I'd met men with eyes like his before, killers, every one of them. I knew that his threats were serious. I would have shot him if I could have gotten away with it. But my floor had five other tenants and not one of them would have lied to save my ass. Two minutes after Joe Cicero walked out the door, I went to the hall to make sure that he was gone. I checked both stairwells and then made sure to lock my own door behind me. Chapter 27. The second phone message was from Mouse. I called it off easy, he said in a subdued voice. I figure you don't want it bad enough, and I already got a business to run. Call me when you get a chance. The last message was from Maya Adamant. Mr. Rollins, Mr. Lee is willing to come to an agreement about your information, and where he cannot see paying you the full amount, he's willing to compromise. Call me at my home number. Instead, I called the harbor master at the Catalina Marina and left a message for my son. Then the international operator connected me with a number Bonnie had left. Hello, a man said. His voice was very sophisticated and European. Bonnie Shea, I uttered in the same muted tones that Mouse had used. Miss Shea is not in at the moment. Is that a message? I almost hung up the phone. If I were a younger man, I wouldn't. Could you write this down, please? I asked Joe Boy Sean. Hold a minute, he said. Then after a moment, he said, Go on. Tell her that there's a problem at the house. It could be dangerous. Tell her not to go there before calling Etta May and say that this has nothing to do with our talk before she left. It's business, and it's serious. I have it, he said, and then he read it back to me. He got every word. His voice had taken on an element of concern. I disconnected the line and took a deep breath. That was all the energy I could expend on Bonnie and Jogway. I didn't have time to act the fool. I dialed another number. Saul Link's Investigations, a woman's voice answered. It was Saul's business line in his home. Doreen? Hi, Easy. How are you? If blessings were pennies, I wouldn't even be able to buy one stick of gum. Doreen had a beautiful laugh. 
I can imagine her soft brown features raising into that smile of hers. Saul's in San Diego, easy, she said, and then more seriously. He told me about Feather. How is she? We got her into a clinic in Switzerland. All we can do now is hope and pray, she reminded me. I need you to give Saul a message, Doreen. It's very important. What is it? You got a pencil and paper? Right here. Tell him that the Bowers case has gone sour, rancid, that I had a visit from Adamant, and a man came here that, uh, uh, just tell Saul that I need to talk to him soon. I'll tell him when he calls, easy. I hope everything's okay. Me too. I pressed the button down with my thumb, and the phone rang under my hand. Actually, it vibrated first, and then rang. I remember because it got me thinking about the mechanism of my phone. Yeah? Dad, what's wrong? Jesus asked. Is Feather okay? She's fine, I said, glad to be giving at least one piece of good news. But I need you to leave Catalina right now and go down to that place you docked near San Diego. Okay, but why? I crossed a bad guy and he knows where we live. Bonnie and Feather are safe in Europe, but I don't know if he got into the house and read Betty's note. So go to San Diego and don't come home till I tell you to. And don't tell anybody, anybody, where you're going. Do you need help, Dad? No, I just need time. And you staying down there will give it to me. I'll call Eddie May if I need to talk to you. You know the drill. I erased all the messages and then disconnected the answering machine so that Cicero wouldn't be able to break in and listen to my news. I left the building by a little used side entrance and walked around the block to get to my car. I drove straight from there over to Cox Bar. Jenny told me that Mouse hadn't been around yet that day, and so he'd probably be there soon. I took a seat in the darkest corner nursing a Pepsi. The denizens of Cox Bar drifted in and out. Grave men and now and then a wretched woman or two. They came in quietly, drank, then left again. They hunched over tables, murmuring empty secrets and recalling times that were not at all what they remembered. At other occasions, I had felt superior to them. I'd had a job, a house in West L.A., a beautiful girlfriend who loved me, two wonderful children, and an office. But now, I was one step away from losing all of that. All of it. At least most of the people at Cox Bar had a bed to sleep in and someone to hold them. After an hour, I gave up waiting and drove off in my souped-up Pontiac. Edame and Mouse had a nice little house in Compton. The yard sloped upward toward the porch, where they had a padded bench and a redwood table. In the evenings, they sat outside eating ham hocks and greeting their neighbors. Edda's sepia hue and large frame, her lovely face and iron-willed gaze would always be my standard for beauty. She came to the screen door when I knocked. She smiled in such a way that I knew Mouse wasn't home. That's because she knew, and I did too, that if there had been no Raymond Alexander, we would have been married with a half dozen grown kids. I had always been her second choice. When I was a young man, that was my sorrow. Hi, easy. Etta, come on in. The entrance to their small house was also the dining room. There were stacks of paper on the table and clothes hung on the backs of chairs. Excuse the mess, honey. I'm just doing my spring cleaning. Where's Mouse, Etta? I don't know. When you expect him? No time soon. He left for Texas. I don't know where he went. After I kicked his butt out. I wasn't ready for that. Every once in a while, Etta would kick Mouse out of the house. I had never figured out why. It wasn't for anything he'd done, or even anything that she suspected. It was almost as if spring cleaning included getting rid of a man. The problem was I needed Raymond, and with him being gone from the house, he could be anywhere. Hello, Mr. Rollins, a man said from the inner door to the dining room. The white man was tall, and even though he was in his mid-thirties, his face belonged on a boy nearer to twenty. Blue eyes, blonde hair, and the fairest of fair skin. That was Peter Rome a man I'd cleared of murder charges after the riots that decimated Watts. 
He met Etta at a funeral I gave to the young black woman, Nola Payne, who had been his lover. Gruff Etta May was so moved by the pain this white man felt over the loss of a black woman that she offered to take him in. His wife had left him. He had no one else. He wore jeans and a t-shirt and the saddest face a man can have. Hey, Pete, how's it going? He sighed and shook his head. I'm trying to get on my feet, he said. I'll probably go back to school to learn auto mechanics or something like that. I got a friend living in a house I own on 116, I said. Primo. He's a mechanic. If I ask him, I'm sure he'll show you the ropes. Roan had been a salesman brokering advertising deals with companies that didn't have offices in Los Angeles. But he had a new life now. Or at least the old life was over, and he was waiting on Etta's porch for the new one to kick in. Don't take my boy away from me so quick, easy, Etta said. You know he earns his keep just working around the house here. Peter flashed a smile. I could see that he liked being kept on the back porch by Etta May. You know where I can find Mouse? I asked. No, Etta said. Peter shook his head. Well, okay then, I said. I got to find him, so if he calls, tell him that. And if Bonnie or Jesus call, just tell them to stay away until I say they can come back. What's going on, Easy? Etta asked, suddenly suspicious. I just need a little help on something. Be careful now, she said. I kicked him out, but that don't mean I want him in a casket. Etta, how you expect somebody like me to be a threat to him? I asked, even though I had once nearly gotten her man killed. You're the most dangerous man in any room you in, Easy, she said. I didn't argue with her assessment because I suspected that she might be right. Chapter 28 There was a place called Henny's on Alameda. It took up the third floor of a building that occupied an entire block. That building once housed a furniture store before the riots depleted its stock. Henny's wasn't a bar or a restaurant. It wasn't a club or a private fraternity either, but it was any one of those things and more at different times of the week. It had a kitchen in the back and round folding tables in the hall. One evening, Hennies would host a recital for some church diva from a local choir. Later that same night, there might be a high-stakes poker game for gangsters in from St. Louis. There had been retirement parties for aldermen and numbers runners there. It was an all-purpose room for a select few. You never went to Henny's unless you'd been invited. At least, I never did. For some people, the door was always open. Mouse was one of them. Marcel John stood at the downstairs alley door that led up to Henny's. Marcel was a big man with a heavyweight's physique and an old woman's face. He had a countenance of sad kindliness, but I knew that he'd killed half a dozen men for money before coming to work for Henny. He wore an old-fashioned brown woolen suit with a gold watch chain in evidence. A purple flower drooped in his lapel. Marcel, I said in greeting. He raised his head in a half-inch salutation, watching me with those watery grandmother eyes. Looking for Mouse, I said. I'd said those words so many times in my 46 years that they might have been an incantation. Not here. He needs to be found. Marcel's wide nostrils flared even further as he tried to get the scent of my purpose. He took in a deep breath and then nodded. I walked past him into the narrow stairway that went upward without a turn to the third floor entrance on the other side of the building. When I neared the top, the ebony wood door swung open and Bob the Baptist came out to meet me. Bob the Baptist's skin was toasted gold. His features were neither Caucasian nor Negro. Maybe his grandmother had been an Eskimo or a Hindu deity. Bob was always grinning, and I knew that if he hadn't gotten the signal from Marcel, he would have been ready to shoot me in the forehead. Easy, Bob said. What's your business, brother? Looking for Mouse. Not here. Bob, who was wearing loose white trousers and a blue box-cut shirt, twisted his perfect lips to add, Oh well, see you later. He needs finding, I said, knowing that even the self-important employees of Henny's wouldn't want to cross Raymond Alexander. He had to let me in, but he didn't have to like it. You armed? He asked, the godlike grin wan on his lips. Yes, I am, I said. 
He sniffed, considering if I was a threat, decided I was not, and moved aside. Henny's was mostly one big room that took up nearly the entire floor. It was empty that day. As I walked from Bob's post to the other side, my footfalls echoed, announcing my approach. Henny was sitting at a small round table against the far wall. There was a brandy snifter in front of her, also the Los Angeles Examiner, open to the sports page. He had a half-smoked cigar smoldering in a cut crystal ashtray. He was a dapper soul, wearing a dark blue suit, an off-white satin shirt, and a red tie held down by a pearl tack. The shirt was so bright that it seemed to flare from his breast. His hair was close-cropped, and his skin was black as the undertaker's shoes. I'm reading the paper, he said, not inviting me to sit. He didn't even look up to meet my eye. You see Mouse in there? I took out my pack of parliaments and produced a cigarette, which I proceeded to light. Raven didn't leave any messages for you, Easy Rollins. The message is for him, I said. He finally looked up. What is it? Henny's eyes had no sparkle to them whatsoever, giving the impression that he had seen such bad times that all of his hope had died. It's for Mouse, I said. Henny stared at me for a few seconds and then called out, Melba! Yes, Daddy? A high-toned woman's voice called back. She came into a doorway about ten feet away. Bring me the phone. Yes, Daddy. Melba belonged with that crew. Her skin was the color of a reddish-brown plantain. Her breasts were small, but her butt was quite large. She balanced precariously on high heels that were on their way to becoming stilts. The black dress was mid-thigh, and she walked with a circular movement which made even that pedestrian activity seem like dancing. She brought a black phone on an extremely long cord. If she'd wanted to, she could have dragged it all the way to Bob the Baptist's chair. She offered the phone to Henny. He declined, saying, Dial Raymond. She did so, though she seemed to have some difficulty maintaining her balance and dialing at the same time. The moments lagged by. Mr. Alexander, she asked in her child's voice. Hold on, I got Daddy on the line. She handed the receiver to Henny. He took it while staring at my forehead. Raymond, I got Easy Rollins here saying that you need finding. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You got that thing covered for Julius? All right, then. Talk to you. He handed the receiver back to Melba and she sashayed away. You know the funeral parlor down on Danker? Henny asked me. Powell's? Yeah. There's a red house next door that got a garage behind it. Raymond's in the apartment above that. Thank you, I said, taking in a deep draft of smoke. And don't come here no more if I don't ask you, he added. So you say that if I'm looking for Raymond, don't ask you? I asked innocently. And Henny winced. I liked that. I liked it a lot. I drove from Henny's to Powell's funeral parlor. I marched down the driveway to the garage next door, but there I stopped. The door was ajar, and those stairs were daring me to come on. It was twilight, and the world around me was slowly blending into gray. Going to mouse over this problem would, I knew, create problems of its own. With no exaggeration, Mouse was one of the most dangerous individuals on the face of the earth. And so, I stopped to consider. But I didn't have a choice. Still, I took the stairs one at a time. The apartment door was also partly open. That was a bad sign. I heard women's voices inside. They were laughing and cooing. Raymond, I said, Come on in, easy. The sitting room was the size of a tourist class cabin on an ocean liner. The only place to sit comfortably was a plush red couch. Mouse had the middle cushion, and two large, shapely women took up the sides. Well, 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 there you are at last. Where you been? Getting into trouble, I said. Mouse grinned. This is Georgette, he said, waving a hand at the woman on his right. Georgette? This Easy Rollins. She stood up and stuck out her hand. 
Hi, Easy. Pleased to meet you. She was tall for a woman, 5'8 or so, the color of tree bark. She hadn't made 25, which was why the weight she carried seemed to defy the pull of gravity. For all her size, her waist was slender. But that wasn't her most arresting feature. Georgette gave off the most amazing odor. It was like the smell of a whole acre of tomato plants, <laughs> earthy and pungent. I took the hand and raised it to my lips so that I could get my nose up next to her skin. She giggled, and I remembered that I was single. And this here is Pinky, Mouse said. Pinky's body was similar to her friend's, but she was lighter skinned. She didn't stand up, but only waved her hand and gave me a half smile. I hunkered down on the coffee table that sat before the couch. How you all doing? I asked. We ready to party tonight. Right, girls? Mouse said. They both laughed. Pinky leaned over and gave Raymond a deep soul kiss. Georgette smiled at me and moved her butt around on the cushion. What you up to, Easy? Mouse asked. He planned to have a party with just him and the two women. At any other time, I would have given some excuse and beaten a hasty retreat. But I didn't have the time to waste and I knew that I had to explain to Mouse why I didn't go on the heist with him before I could ask for help. I need to talk to you, Ray, I said, expecting him to tell me I had to wait till tomorrow. Okay, he said. Girls, we should have some good liquor for this party. Why don't you two go to Victory Liquors over on Santa Barbara and get us some champagne? He reached into his pocket and came out with $200 bills. Why we gotta go over there? Pinky complained. There's a package stole right down the street. Come on, Pinky, Georgette said as she rose again. These men got to do some business before we party. When she walked past me, Georgette held her hand out, palm upward. I kissed that palm as if it were my mother's hand reaching out to me from long ago. She shuddered. And I did too. Mouse had killed men for lesser offenses but I was in the frame of mind where danger was a foregone conclusion. After the women were gone, I turned to Raymond. He was smiling at me. You dog, he said. Chapter 29. Sorry about the job, Ray. I moved over to the couch. He slid to the side to give me room. That's okay, Ease. I knew it wasn't your thing. But you wanted money, and that Chicago syndicate has been my cash cow. Did I cause you a problem with them? They ain't gonna fuck with me, Mouse said with a sneer. He sat back and blew a cloud of smoke at the ceiling. He wore a burgundy satin shirt and yellow trousers. What's wrong then? I asked. What you mean? I don't know. Why are you sending those girls off? I was tired anyway. You want to get out of here? What about Pinky and Georgette? I don't know. Shit, all they want to do is laugh and drink up my liquor. And you want to talk? I ain't got nothing to laugh about. Living my life, I've come to realize that everybody has different jobs to do. There's your wage job, your responsibility to your children, your sexual urges, and then there are the special duties that every man and woman takes on. Some people are artists or have political interests. Some are obsessed with collecting seashells or pictures of movie stars. One of my special duties was to keep Raymond Alexander from falling into a dark humor. Because whenever he lost interest in having a good time, someone, somewhere, was likely to die. And even though I had pressing business of my own, I asked a question. What's going on, Ray? You have dreams, Easy. I laughed, partly because of the dreams I did have, and partly to put him at ease. I'm sure I do. Matter of fact, dreams been kicking my butt this last week. Yeah? Me too. He shook his head and reached for a fifth of scotch that sat at the side of the red sofa. What kind of dreams? I was glass, he said after taking a deep draft. He looked up at me. I would have thought that wide-eyed vulnerability was fear in another man's face. Glass? Yeah. People would walk past me and look back because they saw something, but 
He didn't know what it was. And then, then I bumped into this wall and my arm broke off. Broke off, I said as a parishioner might repeat a minister's phrase for emphasis. Yeah, broke right off. I tried to catch it, but my other hand was glass too and slippery. The broke arm fell to the ground and shattered in a million pieces. And the people was just walking by, not even seeing me. Damn, I said. I was amazed, not by the content, but by the sophistication of Mouse's dream. I had always thought of the diminutive killer as a brute who was free from complex thoughts or imagination. Here we'd known each other since our teens, and I was just now seeing a whole other side of him. Yeah, Mouse warbled. I took a step, and my foot broke off. I fell to the ground and broke all the pieces. And the people just walked on me, breaking me down into sand. That's something else, man, I said, just to keep him in the conversation. That ain't all, he declared. Then, when I was crushed into dust, the wind come and all I am is dust blowing in the air. I'm everywhere. I see everything. You and Edda's married and Lamarck is calling you daddy. People is wearing my jewelry and driving my car. And I'm still there, but can't nobody see me or hear me. Ain't nobody care. In a moment of sudden intuition, I realized then the logic behind Edda's periodic banishment of Mouse. She knew how much he needed her, but he was unaware. And so she'd send him away to have these dreams. And then when he came back again, he'd be pleasant and appreciative of her worth never knowing exactly why. You know, Easy, he said, I've been with two women every night since I walked out on Edda, and I can still go all night long. Got them girls calling in languages they didn't know they could talk. But even if I sleep on a bed full of women, I still have them dreams. Maybe you should give Edda another chance, I suggested. I know she misses you. She do? He asked me with all the innocence of the child he never was. Yes, sir, I said. I saw her just today. Well, Mouse said then, maybe I'll make her wait a couple of days and then give her a break. I doubted if Mouse connected the dream with Etta, even though she came into the conversation so easily. But I could see that he was getting better by the moment. The prospect of a homecoming lifted his dark mood. For a while, he regaled me with stories of his sexual prowess. I didn't mind. Mouse knew how to tell a story, and I had to wait to ask for my favor. Half an hour later, the door downstairs banged against the wall, and the loud women started their raucous climb up the stairs. I better be going, Ray, I said, but I need your help in the morning. I stood up. Stay easy, he said. Georgette likes you, and Pinky gets all jealous when she got a share. Stay, brother, and then in the morning we take care of this trouble you mean. Before I could say no, the women came in the door. Hi, Ray, Pinky said. She had two champagne bottles under each arm. We got a bottle for everybody. Georgette lit up when she saw that I was still there. She perched on the table in front of me and put her hands on my knees. Raymond smiled, and I shook my head. I gotta be going, I said. But the evening wore on, and I was still there. I had nowhere to go. Mouse popped three corks, and the ladies laughed. He was a great storyteller, and I rarely heard him tell the same story twice. After midnight, Pinky started kissing Ray in earnest. Georgette and I were on the couch with him, sitting very close. We were talking to each other, whispering, really. When Georgette looked over and gave a little gasp, I turned and saw that Pinky had worked Ray's erection out of his pants and was pulling on it vigorously. He was leaning back with his eyes closed and a big smile on his lips. Let's go in the other room and give him some privacy, Georgette whispered in my ear. The bedroom was small, too, only large enough to accommodate a king-size bed and a single stack of maple drawers. I closed the door, and when I turned to face Georgette, she kissed me. It was as passionate an embrace as I had ever known. Our tongues were speaking to each other. 
hers telling me that I had her full attention and everything within her power to give, and mine telling her that I was desperately in need of someone to give me life and hope. I put my hand under her coral blouse and laid the hot palm at the base of her neck. She groaned, and so did Pinky in the next room. Georgette reached for the lamp and turned it off. Turn it back on, I said. She did. I sat on the bed and stood her between my knees. Then I started on the buttons of her blouse. She stood still, breathing lightly as I drew the silky top down and dropped it to the floor. She moved then, attempting to sit next to me, but I grabbed onto her forearms, making it clear that she was to stay where she was. I moved close to get my arms around to unhook the black bra she wore. Her nipples were long, hard things. I licked them very lightly, and she held my head, moving the way she wanted my tongue to move. The black miniskirt was tight around her butt, and taking it off while kissing her hard nipples, I pulled... The criminal record, <laughs> you're stigmatized when it comes to housing and employment. Pink panties down, too. No, it's okay. All right. So, here we go. I've been at this pretty much all day. Oops. Let's see if we can get this without any glare. Oop, glare's going to happen. So, I've been at this. Let's see how that does. Uh, nope. Terrible. Okay. Um, I'm working on Leslie Jones all day. I just really made her, uh, oh, I mean, sorry, the glare is terrible. Uh, made her face really pop. Um, got the textures and the, um, the movement I've wanted in the background and in her dress. Hi. And so I'm, I'm really excited. She really is almost done now, and I'm thrilled. Uh, I started her back in Virginia. Last November? October? I'm not even sure. Um, I made a couple videos about her. I thought I had her right. Then I realized I made her look like a black Barbie. She was really horrible. And I've been expanding her face to proper proportions. And then she got funky looking again, and like, she's been through 50 different stages. But now we're really there. Let's see. Let's see if we can get it here. Nope, still can't. She looks distorted in the camera. But anyway, uh, she's, she really is pretty much done. The, the thing that fixed it for me was adding um, the top of her head, adding light to the top of her head. And also just deciding to wipe away some of the teeny tiny details I had in here. Not wipe them away, but add to them and extend them. So, um, yeah. Pretty freaking happy with Leslie Jones, and she may have a new home. There we go. We've had a couple people make inquiries um, at, to J. Louise on our Blue Egg Gallery. We've had a couple people make inquiries, but nobody really um, committing. And, I, you know, it's kind of unfortunate, but I'm glad at the same time because I, I would have been embarrassed and horribly mortified if she had gone out in the condition she was in a couple of days ago. Like I said, now she's looking rightish. Let me see if I can get her kind of... Yeah, she still looks distorted in the camera, though. That's odd. Because she's got total balance in, in, in person. And let me check... Yeah, she's got really good balance in person. The colors are right. I don't know why. It could be just the way she's sitting, the way the camera's sitting. I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, she's almost done. I'm going to take a break. I've been at this for, I'm not sure how long, but forever might be it. And, uh, yeah, there we are. All right. Hope you got some work done, because I'm feeling far more confident and happy. About, about Leslie Jones and the work I've done on her portrait. All right? See you later. Ciao.